Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 663. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 18th, 2021. I got the memo. George got the memo. I hope all our viewers out there are wearing their blue polo shirts because it's blue polo shirt Tuesday on Anglican Unscripted. Only because this is my last shirt before I have to do laundry. <laughs> Why are you wearing a blue shirt? I, I turned on the camera today. Oh, there's George. He's got a blue polo shirt. Must be the same excuse. Susan, my wife's been in Philadelphia for two weeks and I'm mm. out of black shirts. Do you, do you make your own food, too? I mean, these are critical times when our wives aren't around, George. Oh, well, Susan made uh, plenty of frozen, and uh, I'm, out of all, I'm out of canned products, and yes. I'm out of... Uh, and I don't like to eat in restaurants by myself, and I'm too cheap to get takeout food, so huh. I've just been working my way through the larder and the freezer these past two weeks. <laughs> I hope she returns quickly. Uh, we have really. I know real, all that's left are beets and water chestnuts in the pantry <laughs> and sardines. For those trying to keep up with where Monstro is, we moved ourselves to uh, the middle uh, shoreline of Connecticut. We're up by East Lime this week. Uh, we had a great time in the Pennsylvania and New, New York areas uh, visiting stuff. If you saw my pictures of the West Point Museum, that was a lot of fun. Now it's time to sit down and get some work in. We're back in Connecticut to do our doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and eye appointments. And I'm going to get those new anti-glare glasses so you guys don't have to see my... If you do it right here, you can see that I almost have Hulk eyes. See that? Isn't that amazing? So uh, getting all those things taken care of. Before we get too far into the show, please like us, share us, go to the comment sections on YouTube and comment away. Uh, comment if you're wearing a blue polo shirt today. You can uh, post a picture, of course, if you are. Um, and subscribe if you're not subscribed. And we have a podcast for those who don't want to see us in our blue polo shirts. George, as far as I'm concerned, we've hit uh, what I call post-COVID. The all-clear sign has been given by the CDC that if you've been uh, double vaccinated and you are allowed to go now into public, you're allowed to go into buildings you're allowed to gather together you don't have to social distance if you've had the vaccine everything is a-okay walmart said you can come to our stores and not wear a mask target yesterday issued a statement said you can come to our stores and not wear a mask baseball has said if you've been vaccinated we have vaccine uh sections vaccinated sections of our uh, baseball fields where you can come and not wear a mask and order beer and peanuts and you won't pay a lot of money, we promise you. So we have hit the all clear where we are now post COVID in my, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the CDC is concerned. Are we post COVID as far as the church is concerned? There's a study out that came from Europe that said the church is likely to lose 27% of its members, at least in, in real churches, because of COVID. They're not gonna return. They've lost what we call the habit. They've lost the, uh, I need to go because uh, I get my fellowship, my friendship, my uh, spiritual feeding from church. I found places online that are going to continue online and I will get my spiritual feeding there. I will maintain my friendships socially uh, or through Zoom. I don't need church in my life like I thought I needed church in my life a year ago. The study that we've reprinted at the press release and links to on Anglican Inc. Uh, shows that, as Kevin said, that rural churches will lose up to about 27% of its attendance. Urban and suburban churches, uh, smaller amounts, 15 and 10%. And the reason is not because people have lost faith, but because, and this focused on the Church of England primarily, but the, the people in the pews have basically listened to the leaders of the Church of England say, you don't really need to go to church to be a good Christian. And after being told this for about a year and a half, up to a third of the people now believe it. And it's not a loss of faith. It's not a loss of uh, Christian witness. It's just people have been told and they have discovered that they don't need to be in communion to be a Christian. Now, I think this is a terrible terrible thing um, 
and I also anecdotally see that happening in the United States, but what the study is basically showing is that the public stance taken by the Church of England has had consequences on its long-term viability. We for years have been predicting the Church of England is about to drop dead and yes it's been coughing up blood last night but this is another uh, this is another mark and strike against it it's not good news no it's not and I think it's recoverable I can think you you can become uh, I think going into COVID the church it's uh, changed so much liberally that uh, there was just really you know it, the habitual people just went habitually. Now there's a point, well, why do I need to go back to church? They, there's no difference between church and culture. There's no difference between what the church teaches and what the culture accepts. Um, why do I need to go to church? So you've lost that habituals. Don't forget, some people have died. Uh, nobody in my parish has died of COVID. I don't know. I think you may have one or two. Uh, in America. Nursing home it, residents. Yeah. Early on. Uh, in America, there's been a, a percentage of people who've died and will be returning to church, but that's not a large uh, section. So one third, 27% is a lot. And will the church survive? I say real churches don't survive because the people will stop going and if they want church, they'll find it somewhere online. Part of it is the, uh, well, it doesn't help the gasoline prices are shooting up. And so if you need to drive 20 miles to go to church in the country, uh, that's starting to get expensive. Uh, demographically, the Census Bureau calls my area rural. We're a rural church in both the church's statistics and de government statistics. Mm -hmm. We will probably see a loss of that magnitude. Part of it is people have died. Part of it is we have a number of older people, maybe about 30 all told, who have moved away because after being locked up in their house for a year and not being able near family and children, they're fearful that if this happens again, I don't want to be found dead in my house. So people are moving back to their children, back up north in some cases. The other thing is that we do have a number of people who have lost the habit. Now, I'm a believer in big data. I follow everybody. I know everybody's name. I know if you walk into my church, I I don't take your fingerprints in a DNA swab, but we do just about everything else. You give them a little tile to take home with them, you know, here. And, you know, I'm starting to see, you know, whereas somebody who was here every week for, you know, five, six, seven years, I'm now seeing them camping or fishing every other week with the pictures on Facebook. So they've lost the habit of consistency. The in our diocese uh, on last Saturday released rules allowing us to relax the restrictions of masks and social distancing. We can go back to we can go back to full capacity. Uh, there's some things that I'm not happy with. They're asking us to segregate people into vaccinated and non-vaccinated seating in the church. And I don't know how I'm going to do that, uh, but that's another story. Because uh, people don't have tattoos across their forehead with a big V or NV. Mm -hmm. But we are seeing some small signs of growth. And unfortunately, it's coming from refugees from the small the churches that are smaller than us in our 10 to 15 mile radius. Primarily Episcopal churches at this stage. Uh, one family who dropped off their papers to transfer to our church said, you know, we just are so exhausted and tired of trying to keep our church alive of 40, 50 people. Now we haven't been open for a year and a half and we've just been doing fellowship online and that's not church for us. We'd rather stop fighting and be happy and put our focus on worship rather than keeping the lights on and the building heated or air conditioned. Yeah. I there is a there's a place where a church hits that that critical mass uh where you're at the the 2025 and once you hit the 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 20 or 1520 people leave and and find other fellowship elsewhere we want a place we can take and, and put our kids in sunday school we want a place mm -hmm. where we have more than just 
uh, a retired clergy who comes in and serves three other parishes as ours because we're not getting a Bible study during the week. We're not getting uh, special services uh, when we need them and want them. And we're not getting the full uh, Christian calendar. And they go and seek other churches when possible. It's it's the unknown that lies ahead of us, and that's frightening. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's manageable and doable. Yes, there are going to be exceptions. Yes, there's going to be that church of 20 that's grown to 25 during COVID, or from 40 to 50. But I think taken as a whole, we're seeing a further winnowing of the church um, as people lose habits, as people lose connectedness. and. Maybe this is the church outworking of the theory that has been around for years of bowling alone. That uh, we have a we have we may not have a Wendy's in my town, but we do have a bowling alley, and the bowling leagues have not started up again. And I don't think. And chatting with somebody who was very active bowler, they don't think they ever will. Wow. So that those form of social recreation that mm. brought essentially older people who had moved down here from the northeast into little bowling leagues and teams that's not that's not reforming and it's so i don't wish to compare faith in jesus christ to bowling yeah. but it's about the habits and socialization and sociability of people and that's been changed by COVID. it has and when i use the the, the term all clear when and we get this from the the bombings in London and in England w was where the the all clear call came from. They would come out of these bomb shelters and they would see uh, their cities and towns had been bombed, and they would have to rebuild and rethink their society. How are we going to uh, to start over and start again? How do we socialize again? How do we go to church again? How do we start our businesses again and function as a society again? And now that we're coming out of COVID, we're going to, have to do the same thing. We have the all clear. How do we function as a society again? And things have changed. Kevin, you live out of an RV. You know, you guys work 40 hours a week. You travel the country. Um, how can you tell us about attending churches? I can't. <laughs> it's all different now. Well, what I think, if were I to offer advice to people in leadership, this is the time that you step up if you're a bishop or a district superintendent, whatever your denominational practice is, and encourage your ministers, the guys at the coalface mm -hmm. who are actually doing the daily work. Um, I just got contacted by the bishop's secretary saying he's going to visit in December. It's the first I've heard of him person from him personally mm -hmm. in about a year and a half, two years. I mean, I get the public announcements, and but I've never had a phone call. How you doing? How are things going? What are your you know, what's, how can I help you? Not with money, but spiritually and pastorally. Mm -hmm. Were I offering advice to bishops, and I guess I am, this is a time that you put on your pastoral boots and get out in the field and encourage guys like me who've basically seen seven, eight years of work go for naught in terms of attendance, and they're basically starting over again. Uh, and that could be very discouraging. Um, I, if I were 10 years older, I'd be tempted to throw in the towel at this stage because, you know, I'd given my best, my best years of my life, and it's back where I started. And do I have the energy to do it again? Well, thankfully, I do at this stage of my life, but my peers are 67, 68, 69, 70. I don't see them having the energy to do this in this right. difficult day. Well, you brought up bishops and, uh, you know, many different roles the bishops have. One is defender of the faith, and I want to transition to another story out of England. There was a school chaplain who was dismissed for talking about tolerance. Yeah, and, I'm just looking down to look up his name, Bernard okay. Randall. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Randall was the chaplain of Trent College, which is a Church of England affiliated private uh, school in the north of England. Uh, the man's in his late 40s. He has a very good career in the chaplaincy world. He'd been a chaplain at one of the Cambridge colleges. And he gave a sermon where he basically encouraged young boys and girls to think for themselves, not to just swallow wholeheartedly the gay, uh, LGBTIQ, whatever it is, 
theology that and worldview that's being handled to them, handed to them, that there are other ways of thinking. One of them is the Christian way. And so, A, he was not, well, long and short of it was the school reported him to the police as a potential terrorist for hate speech. Giving a Christian sermon, telling children to think for themselves and to use their brains and to basically engage in dialogue with other points of view was hate speech for the headmaster of this school. Well, the police investigated and found the fellow, no, he didn't contravene any hate speech rules, but then he was fired by the school, a Church of England school for his sermon and saying that you represent worldview that we cannot tolerate at this Church of England school. We cannot tolerate. We cannot, we cannot tolerate. tolerate the Christian worldview. Well, he reached out to the Archbishop of York, the Archbishop of Canterbury, no help, not interested. N no Can't word, help. no. Local Bishop, Libby Lane, uh, Bishop of Derby, not interested in helping. And in fact, their office told the Daily Mail, which has been leading the coverage of this story, that, well, we really can't speak about something that's before the law courts because he's filing an unfair dismissal claim and it would prejudice the outcome if we actually did our job and, of being a bishop. And defended him. Yes. And here, here's the thing. Um, a month or two ago, we had a young black curate in the inner city of London uh, who's gay, who was attacking the memory of this older fellow, Captain Tom something, I forget his name, who had done a great deal in fundraising, was sort of a British cultural national hero, and he attacked this guy and said all sorts of nasty, critical race theory things. That guy was a real piece of work. And the Church of England's bishop spent over backwards not to be seen as hurting his feelings. You know, they defended his right to speak and all this and that. And he was promoting and pronouncing something that is categorically opposed to the central doctrines and teachings of the Christian faith. Now we have a white man in his late 40s who is preaching the Christian faith, the central tenets of it, is the bishops can't give him the time of day. No. Well, let's cover tolerance. Let me, let me give you tolerance 101. Tolerance 101 is, I do not demand that you change, and you do not demand that I change. Okay, that's simple tolerance. Nobody demands anything of anybody. We have open thought, open speech, open exchange of ideas. That's tolerance. To say that we can't tolerate somebody's speech is intolerant. And that's what's happening here within Church of England schools. And if we're not going to defend it as a bishops in the Church of England, you're being intolerant as well. And you're not defending the faith, and you are AWOL in your responsibilities as Church of England bishops. And this is one of the most embarrassing uh, things I've seen in the Church of England in the last five years. I don't know who's running the Church of England schools department, but there's another Church of England schools story this week that is just as bad. Advice was handed out as to, to Church of England schools as to what hymns to sing during school assemblies. And Church of England schools were advised not to sing hymns that were too Christian. Uh, so don't sing Faith of Our Fathers, Holy Faith, or Onward Christian Soldiers, or Lift high the anything cross. like that. <laughs> sing Kumbaya, and because we don't want to offend the non-Christians and the uh, sort of basically agnostic Christians who want people who sent their children there so they get a good education. We don't want to offend them. So we don't want to, we don't want a Christian ethos for these Christian schools. We want to basically be the middle muddle that stands for nothing. And, you know, my goodness, uh, there's some, there was uh, one thing in the spectator where an Agnes, Ag, an atheist and about atheists who have gone to church schools as a young boy said, you know, this is part of our cultural heritage that the Church of England is jettisoning, jettisoning for the lowest common denominator namby pambiness. It's the it's emblematic of the failure of leadership at the Church of England, both on the bishops' level with the uh, Bernard Randall case and with the schools case and the institutional level. They cannot 
be bothered to stand for what they are there for. Instead, it's, you know, institutional CYA. You know, they've basically adopted John Lennon's Imagine song and made it their gospel. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the gospel of John Lennon uh, being forthright and forever in the Church of England. It's sad to say, let's transition to another story before I get real angry with the Church of England, more so. Uh, Middle East conflict, it continues on. It's been continuing on for, oh, at least 6,000 years. Why not go longer? Um, we now have uh, the Palestinians, uh, led by Hamas and the Hezbollah, launching uh, thousands of rockets into Israel. They're doing a little bit of damage, not much. Uh, some people have died. Israel has defended itself and, and attacked Hamas and Hezbollah. They uh, took out the, the tunnel system early, or late last week, uh, killing lots of the Hamas leaders. And this thing is not going to end in our lifetime, certainly, because every time we come close to having peace, peace in the Middle East, the leadership of Palestine, the Palestinians, well, they're not really Palestinians, they're auto-Turks, but we'll get to that some other time in other dis- discussion. Hamas and Hezbollah say no. Bill Clinton is very famous for having the most extensive talks between the leadership Prime Minister of Israel and the leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah having them together and having Israel offer everything. We'll give you all the land you wanted and requested in previous things. We'll give you a little bit more. We will uh, offer financial assistance to the Gaza Strip. We'll do all these little programs to help with hospitals and health care and everything you want to allow for a Palestinian state and an Israel state. We'll give you 99.9%. But the one thing that Hezbollah and Hamas and the Palestinians want is no Israel. This only ends when there is no Israel, when there are no more Zionists. That's when we will be happy. And we, Israel just can't agree to that. Ah, you know, I, we'll give you 99%, but that we're going to hold back on that one last 0.0%. Uh, we're not going to... Uh, commit suicide just so you can have your peace well i believe the palestinian government is hopelessly corrupt oh, yeah. and is not a uh, honest partner or traitor and i actually don't believe in a two-state system i believe in a one-state system hmm. um the uh there's uh, the palestinians are unable and, un- and unwilling to be honest brokers and partners in this process Individual Palestinians are wonderful people. Yeah, I, I would say that. I would all. say I would say the leadership. I'm, I'm just talking about the people who run the show, mm-hmm. and in the lifetime of the state of Israel, we've had a number of ways that these types of clashes have been resolved. You have the Czechs expelling the Germans from the Sudetenland, and the Poles expelling the Germans. You have the uh, Turks expelling the Greeks from northern Cyprus. Mm-hmm. These are horrible things and tragedies, but we don't worry anymore about the crisis in the Sudetenland and in Danzig and in Cyprus. Um, only Israel has to play by the rules and allow these people who hate them to stay, even though they've lost the battle time and again. If Moshe Dayan had a pair of balls in, when they took East Jerusalem, they should have taken the Temple Mount, and instead they pulled back. I, I can't. I don't understand that. I mean, that that doesn't make any sense to me. And I think history will show that to be a mistake. You know, the uh, the French kicked out of Algeria, the mm-hmm. the Italians out of Libya. Hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, move across borders when you have these things, and they're all fundamentally unfair. But. The only way forward, I think, is for is uh, the hard option, not the soft option. And at this stage, the Saudis have given up on the Palestinians. The basically everybody's given up on them except uh, the Iranians, and the Iranians do this to destabilize the Saudis. Well, I don't uh, think Joe gave up on them. Joe thinks that, that <laughs> there's a future with uh, uh, Palestine making tough decisions here, but. You know, we, and I, the reason I have no hope in uh, 
this being solved any time is because there have been really good attempts in the past to make a solid peace in the Middle East. And I think Bill Clinton tried the hardest. And he wrote his book after it failed, and he explained why. He mm-hmm. said, the Palestinians have poor leadership, and they always allow for the terrorists and the, the Hamas and the Hezbollah to uh, lead them, and Hezbollah's only desire is the destruction of Israel. When your only desire is the uh, uh, destruction of your enemy, there can be no peace. And yeah, find for me the compromise position of, I want you dead, and I want to stay alive. Where's the compromise? Yeah. Uh, I want you, you half dead. Uh, you know, it. I know this is going to cause some of our uh, uh, viewers to get all bent out of shape, and we've got the requisite number of anti-Semites who post on here too. And every time we say something about the Jews, they all go banana cakes and everything. But really, uh, we're not going to see this settled in our lifetime unless something does happen that sort of resolves this once and for all. Now, I have to say, there was one sort of fun, now, a personal statement, I used to be a reporter for the Jerusalem Post, and I even covered the uh, first Lebanon war for the Jerusalem Post. I was based in London, and I covered it, not on the battlefield, but there, when I was living in England. The IDF, Israel Defense Force, tweeted that they were preparing to send ground troops into Gaza in this last week. And Western newspapers picked this up and amplified it. NBC, for instance, said, Israeli troops are now on the ground on Gaza. Well, the Hamas has all these tunnels underneath the uh, earth and inside buildings and things at civilian places. They don't play fair. And as soon as they heard the word that Israel was on the ground, they evacuated their tunnel system because they didn't want to be trapped in there. And they took up defensive positions. Well, the Israelis tricked them. It was fake news. And as soon as the tunnel door blast doors were open and they started to take their defensive positions, the jets hit, killed several hundred of these people coming out of the ter- tunnels and blew up the tunnels because now the blast doors were open. So the moral of the story is don't believe NBC. <laughs> you don't want to die. No. Well, the press uh, building. Uh, was attacked and destroyed where the AP and uh, other presses were held and you know I I don't feel sorry for the press in in this case because they have been a speaking piece for uh, Hezbollah and the Hamas for way too long Um, this doesn't get resolved in the press I, I do want to kind of move on because we Anglican Scripted, Anglican TV, uh, the Anglican Communion have been hard on Justin. Justin pulled one out here, and he denounced the anti-Semitism going on in England with the pro-Palestinian marches that happened this weekend. And I want to say thank you, Justin. That is your role. You served it well. You stood up and you said, no, we will not do that. And we, as uh, Britons, will not allow ourselves to become anti-Semites. Bravo. The Quran has some troublesome passages in it if you're a Jew. In mm-hmm. other words, when Muhammad uh, and his followers massacred all the Jews in one situation and the command not to be friends with the Jew mm-hmm. and that the Jews are worse, than, uh, lower than apes and monkeys. Well, there were all these protests in around London over the weekend and Palestine, pro-Palestinian activists and British Muslims took to the streets demanding death to Israel, death to the Jews, mouthing these words from the Quran. And Justin Welby responded on social media saying this is abhorrent. Prime Minister Boris Johnson did as well. Uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan did. But it was good to see Justin Welby because this was a shock. I hate to say it, but it was a shocker. He did the right thing, and he did it at the right time. Yeah, yeah we applaud that. We really do. Um, all right, transitioning again to another story. Out of England, the UK, Bishop of London is going to be in the news, or at least on our radar, because she used something called coercive when she talked about conversion therapy. And the whole story is, and people here in America know that uh, um, local towns, municipalities, states, 
have tried to ban conversion therapy. Whenever it gets to the federal courts, federal courts back off and say, no, we can't ban conversion therapy because it's a religious rights and it's a free speech rights. Those are the Bill of Amendments, and no, we're not going to touch that. They yeah, don't have that uh, in the For UK. instance, the town of Boca Raton in Florida and the state of New Jersey tried to ban conversion therapy, and mm -hmm. the Boca Raton case went up to the Court of Appeals, I think it's in Atlanta, and the Court of Appeals ruled on a two-to-one vote that this is a free association, free speech, religious freedom. If you wish to have this done, the state has no power to forbid the speech and the action and the association meeting. Uh, England does not have these uh, the Bill of Rights that we do. And there's similar push on the, under the way in Canada and in some of the uh, Australian provinces or states to ban conversion therapy. And in the Queen's speech, which is where the government's agenda for the forthcoming parliamentary term is presented, the government of Boris Johnson wants to ban conversion therapy. Well, the Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, caused some raised eyebrows all round and the white hot fury of the liberals by saying that the Church of England opposes coercive gay conversion therapy. Well, that's a whole and different ballgame. <laughs> now, the General Synod said it was against uh, gay conversion therapy, and it was pointed out to them this means that we're not able to pray for people to help them with their sexual identity, sexual orientation. And this is not what the Church of England meant, the Mass, but what it did in its documents. And so Sarah Mullally, on behalf of the Church of England, is now calling it coercive, meaning if you want to have gay conversion therapy, that should be up to you. But if you're being forced to do it and you're an adult, that should be banned by the government, which fundamentally changes the uh, equation. Now, the Church in Wales bishops have all wholeheartedly in favor of all, all uh, six bishops representing all 12 Welsh Anglicans um, are opposed to any sort of gay conversion therapy. But the Sarah Mullally has taken a nuanced position saying only if you don't want it, which is the position of the U.S. courts and government, that you mm -hmm. cannot be compelled to think and to say or to do things if you're a, an adult that you don't want to do. It's interesting because the way she phrased it is almost like she's known people who've been successfully uh, gone through that type of therapy. It's, you know, I know people who've gone through conversion therapy successfully. I know people who've gone through conversion therapy unsuccessfully. Uh, yeah, the know, ex-gay uh, movement is real. Yes, absolutely. And, and if you'd want to talk about, you know, every so often we'll have these sob stories of, oh, the oppression of gay people. If you want to talk to a real oppressed minority, talk to the ex-gays. Mm -hmm who uh, are despite, you know, are just treated abysmally. They're told they don't exist, that what they've gone through, what their so psychosocial uh, therapy has taught them makes is a lie. Um, th it's terrible. Yeah. So I'm we should see what happens right as that goes to the, uh, the UK courts. Um, you know, they don't have, like we said before, they don't have the same rights. Uh, sometimes they're just working on a, a broken version of the Magna Carta. Uh, let's talk, what's the next on our list here? Oh, you ran into this. Uh, critical race theory reaches assistance programs in the government. Uh, you have your own personal experience now. Yes, uh, we've been supporting an orphanage down where I am for years. Uh, it's a small orphanage, uh, one house with six children, and we've been helping raise money to build a second wing with, for another six children. And over the years, we've had volunteers from the church go in and uh, do tutoring. We bring them clothing and help them celebrate all just the things that churches do. I would take them manatee watching. I took them to the Phillies game spring season last year. Well, executive orders out of the new government in Washington have basically closed the doors to religious organizations working with any orphanage or foster home that has uh, government funding to it because all the volunteers have to go through a retraining that includes critical race theory and teaching. So the net result is that these homes have shut their doors to Christian uh, groups because the what they're getting from Washington, from the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education is uh, basically 
anti-religious uh, propaganda. Mm -hmm. That's not that the people at the orphanage has changed anymore. They know how important this is, but they need to keep the they need they can't afford to lose government support. And our new government is taking an avowedly anti-Christian stance. And if you want to help, if you want to volunteer, you have to agree and think as they do. Yeah, it's it's amazing what's happened at at the army level, at the uh, Department of Justice level. All the departments in, the, in government are now being forced to adopt uh, critical race theory uh, in teaching and in you know retraining their employees. Um, the cool thing is, there's a lot of pushback. Uh, yeah, in, in Florida and I think in other in a number of other states, mm -hmm. teaching of critical race theory in public schools is forbidden. Yeah. Uh, the, we have a very strong, popular conservative governor in Florida named Ron DeSantis, Yay. and DeSantis is basically saying that uh, if you any if you want mo if your public school system want money from the state the state of Florida, mm -hmm. you can't do this. Uh, well, the federal government says you must do it if you want money from the federal government. So the poor schools are being caught in between and usually follow the state line because ninety percent of their funding comes from the state and ten percent from the federal. Yeah. But um, we do need to change administrations quickly. We're, what, we're, <laughs> gas prices going higher, inflation knocking on the door. Uh, the critical race theory is probably the most abhorrent part of the, the new administration. Um, you know, or the Middle East. The Middle East. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> <we're> like <laughs> back to Obama years all over again. Oh, well. Well, no, I mean, I'm sure, but you know, Kevin, remember. Mean tweets are much mean worse. Tweets. Yeah, he doesn't tweet. They're much Thank worse. God. He doesn't tweet. Thank God. Don't you um, feel? Don't you feel much better that we don't have mean tweets, but we do have war, poverty, famine, inflation. Uh, we 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 filled up autocratic Monstro. government. We we filled up Monstro. It's one hundred ga gallon tank the other day at Biden's price. It was low. Oh, ouch. So, all right. Uh, final two stories. Uh, new moderator bishop in Pakistan, George. Yeah, this is a good news story, Zad Marshall, a uh, longtime bishop. He had been bishop in Iran, in the province of Jerusalem in the Middle East. Then he had been bishop, I think, of Lahore. I'm not certain. I may have that wrong. Or, and he's now been elected moderator of the, of the Church of Pakistan. This is somebody who's been a, ever since in my memory, in 98, he was on side, part of the co conservative coalition. Uh, I don't know if he's been, been to Gafcon, because Manir Nice who was his primate at the time, sort of kept his people out. But this is somebody who is firmly in the Gafcon camp. Oh, now that he's his yeah. own man as moderator of the Church of Pakistan, I think we'll see another friendly face among the Gafcon Primates Council if the guys want to invite him to join. Mm -hmm. So this is good. And here's the other thing, and I hate to put it in these terms, but this is the honest Pakistani bishop. Uh, I know. We talk about in India and Pakistan very close to each other, except warring all the time. Uh, this is one of the good guys. All right. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we're very honored to see him uh, become the moderator slash bishop of uh, Pakistan. Um, l final topic: comments on Anglican Inc. For people who are new to the program, Anglican Unscripted is kind of the sister site to Anglican Inc. We talk about the stories that are posted there, and we talk about the the wider Christian news events happening around the world. When we get to some topics, there's lots of comments. Uh, especially uh, news surrounding LGBTQ stuff, news surrounding Israel stuff, news surrounding bad bishops. Lots of comments. Uh, some people have been commenting on some of our uh, uh, gay stories. I use that in quotes. That you know, there's you know, there's soon gonna be gay blessings in in a province and diocese in Mexico. You guys don't know. It, it's slowly taking over the world. And you're going to be left behind if you don't catch up sooner on what's really happening. George, our inside guy, knows more than our commenters. Well, I saw this comment saying that uh, the bishop in southeastern Mexico, Diocese of Southeastern Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, had authorized same sex blessings. And this struck me wrong because in 2010, the Mexican General Synod said that we do not permit or authorize any ecclesiastical blessings or marriages of same-sex couples. Now, Mexico allows same-sex marriages Mexico, and on the state level, Mexico yeah, City. Yeah, there's cities that won't touch it. Uh, no, Mexico City allows it, other places allow it. Uh, 
But Southeast Mexico is a very conservative part of Mexico. It's not on the leading edge of social change. And I happen to know the Bishop of Southeast Mexico, Julio Martin. And then somebody sent me this draft document about same-sex blessings. And so I contacted Bishop Martin and Bishop Martin says, no, we're not doing same-sex blessings. The, the policy of the Anglican Church in Mexico is against it. However, we are encouraged to take part in dialogue on this issue. And this draft document was part of the dialogue process. What would it look like if we did do same-sex blessings? So uh, I hate to disappoint those who thought there's another uh, win in the gay marriage column, but no, Mexico's not jumped on board yet. No. And unless the General Synod reverses itself, they're not going to be on board. But as we've seen in history, that can happen. You know, it's important that you uh, lift up godly leaders within your church, uh, get them to the deacon, clergy, and bishop level, and uh, keep the church healthy. All right, that's all. Well, we had seven stories, George, and we did it all in one thing. We're not recording on Friday this week. I'm having some uh, oral surgery on Thursday. I doubt I'll be talking much on Friday. You like, yay, finally. And uh, so we'll do this show again next Tuesday. You're available next Tuesday, right, George? Yes, I am. You're going to have a, a, a black shirt? Well, Susan, I hope we'll do the laundry when she I gets back. I will have a black shirt. I just finished the laundry now. I will <laughs> greet her with large baskets on the uh, kitchen table. <laughs> You've been gone so long. <laughs> I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 663 of Anglican Unscripted.